Okay, we've been talking in this module about tools that will be useful for doing proofs, but let's actually do our first direct proof. So one last thing before we start, let's recall the universal conditional statement, because when we do direct proofs, we're going to be using the universal conditional statement a lot. In fact, for everything we try to prove with a direct proof, we're going to first try to write it as a universal conditional statement. So if we recall, a universal conditional statement has this form. For all x in some domain, some property of x, if it's true, implies that some property q of x is also true. So an example of this might mean, might be, um, for all students, um, if a student is at our school, then that student lives in our state, for example. Or for all even numbers, if the number is greater than zero, then that number is greater than one. And these are silly examples, but what we can do is we can write most any statement as a universal conditional statement. We're going to see that again in a bit. Um, I want to make take another quick look at the truth table for a conditional statement. And this is, I'm going to write the truth table for a simple conditional statement, but it's the same idea for a uh, universal conditional statement. So we have P, we have Q, we have P implies Q. So let's remember this, recall this uh, truth table for the implication. True implies true is true. True implies false is false. And the last two rows are vacuous truths. So those are true as well. So let's think about this for a minute. If we're trying to prove this statement, P implies Q. So we want to prove this statement true. Well, there's actually three ways of doing that. Right, this first row it's true, and these last two rows it's true. The only row it's not true is that second row. So, what we can say is that if the statement is false, I don't care about it. Because if it's false, if our, excuse me, if P is false, then our statement is true. So if P is false, I don't, I don't have to worry about it. So that means I only need to worry about the situation where P is true. Right? P is true. Those are the only situation I have to worry about. And if I start with P being true, and I can show that Q is also true, then I've shown the statement is true. And this is the idea behind how we do a direct proof. What we're gonna do, and I'll, I'll put it more explicitly on the next page, is we're going to assume that P is true, because again, we don't care if P is false, because then our statement is true. So we just don't worry about that. So we're going to start with assuming that P is true, and then we're going to try to prove or deduce that Q is true. And if we can do that, then we know our statement is true. If we cannot show Q is true, then we may be in this row. So we hope we're not, um, and we're going to try to prove Q true. And if we can, then we know our statement is true. Because so we know we're in either this row, this first row, or one of 
these last two rows. So the methods of a direct proof, as I said on the last slide, uh, we first express the statement as a universal conditional statement. Right. For all x in our domain, if p of x is true, then q of x is true. Since we don't care about that la those last two rows in the truth table, we're going to start by supposing that p of x is true. All right. So we're going to start by supposing that x is some particular but arbitrary, a, uh, generic, right? we're using the principle of um, principle of generalizing from the generic particular. I always forget those. It's quite a mouthful. Um, and we're gonna so we're gonna pick a suppose x is a particular but arbitrarily chosen element of the domain for which the um, hypothesis p of x is true. So we're going to suppose. X is an element of the domain and P of X is true. And then finally, in conclusion, we're going to show that Q of X is true or try to show that Q of X is true. And if we can, then again, looking at our truth table, that means we are in that first row and that means our statement is true. Okay, so we're going to try to deduce q of x. So you may want to scribble these down and keep them somewhere because it's going to help going through the proof. We're going to do a proof next to illustrate this. So let's take a look. We're going to start by proving that 4rs is even for all integers r and s. That's how you read this line up here. We're going to prove that 4rs is even for all integers r and s. You could also say for all r and s that are integers. Okay, so I'm going to do step one. If you recall, step one, we want to express the statement as a universal conditional statement. It may not seem obvious how to do that here. All right, we want to say for all something, if something is true about those variables and something else is true, but we don't have an if then in our in this statement here. Um, a very common trick that's used in this situation is to write it like this. Say for all R and S. And now I'm leaving R and S as being in anything. So our domain is everything. It's numbers, it's integers, it's uh, complex numbers, it's words, it's letters, it's animals, it's just everything. And I'm going to say, if R and S are integers, ooh, there's my if, then... 4rs is even. Okay, so this is my step one. And if you parse this, this is my p of x, and this is my q of x, or in this case, r and s. Okay, so that's step one. Let's go back to our plan here. Um, step two is we want to suppose the first part, right? We are supposing that x is an element of the domain and p of x is true, which is just this first part of our universal conditional statement. Well, not quite. We're going to... leave that for all out because I'm I'm going to leave this generic but I'm going to just suppose that 
x is in our domain and p of x is true. And I'm just going to leave x generic there. Okay, so proof. You always want to start your proofs by labeling it. In this case, a direct proof is the default, so we could write direct proof, or we could just write proof. Suppose R and S are any integers, right? That's really this first part of our statement. So that's step two. Um, what's our goal? Well, let's take a look back over here. Our goal is to deduce Q of X. To deduce, to show that Q of X is true, given this assumption. So we want to show that 4RS is even, All right? That's our goal. This is our goal. So this is step one, step two. If we can accomplish our goal, we'll have done step three. Okay. So what does it mean for 4RS to be even? Well, it means, um, so I'm going to sort of rewrite this goal. Uh, we want to look at the definition of even, which is that it equals 2 times some integer k. Okay, so let's try to do that. I'm going to say 4RS. Well, what do I know? I don't want to say it's even, so I cannot, this big emphasis point, I cannot start out with this. Cannot start with that. I cannot emphasize this enough. We cannot start with this. Because that's what we're trying to show. We cannot start with what we're trying to show. That's like saying, well, uh, I want to show that aliens exist, so I'm going to assume that aliens exist. Well, that doesn't make any sense, logically. So I'm just going to start with 4RS and try to manipulate it and see if we can figure out how to make it demonstrate that it's even. So what can I do with 4RS? Well... Um, I can pull a 2 out, so I'm going to factor this 4 into 2 times 2, and we still have our R and our S. So why can I do that? Remember, you want to ask every step, why can I do this? Because of algebra. Give a justification for everything you do. Okay, well, looking at this... It looks like if I could somehow show that that's an integer, I would have my 2 times some integer. So let's let k, k is just a variable name, it's like x, y, p. I'm going to let k equal 2 times r times s. And what do I know about k? Well, I'm going to notice that k is an integer because it is a product of integers. And we know that integers are closed under multiplication, 
That was one of our assumptions from a previous video. Now, you don't have to write this big thing out every time. I'm going to write it once here, and you can pause this and write it out if you want. Um, in general, the way I, I typically write that is I will say... I typically justify this as saying, notice k is an integer under integer closure properties. Okay, but you can write the whole thing out if you want. Okay, so what well, this means and 4rs is equal to 2 times k, where k is an integer. Well, that's the definition of even. And that's what we were trying to show. Right up here in our goal, we wanted to show that it was even, which was to be shown. And there's a couple ways we can end the proof. Um, just like a sentence is ended with a period, a proof is typically either ended with a little filled in box, or you can write QED which means, um, which was to be demonstrated in Latin, okay? And this is step three. Okay, so we have our three steps for the proof. We write it as a universal conditional statement. That's step one, universal conditional statement. We suppose the first part of the universal conditional statement. So that's step two. And then I like to write what my goal is. What is What am I trying to show? I'm trying to show this second part of my universal conditional statement, and then I'm gonna actually show it using the third step. And it is critical that you not start with what you're trying to show. So we cannot start with that. Instead, we start with what we have and we try to manipulate it to get to where we're trying to go. Okay, and here is a written version of what I just did in case that being typed out is easier to read. At the end of each one of these proofs, I will be posting uh, a written out version um, that you can pause on.